Hey lore lovers, my name's Eric with the Lorebrarians YouTube channel, and today we'll be taking a study in blood by looking at the history and representation of vampires throughout Magic the Gathering's multiverse. Vampires are a dangerous and fear-evoking type of creature, and their presence has been documented on several planes. Despite many regional differences, there are several traits all vampires share. Their hunger for the blood or life force of others, despite not having any blood of their own unnatural physical strength, enhanced healing powers, and the ability to fly. Many vampires have a preference for darkness and are physically hurt by sunlight, but it's not always the case. Vampires can range from being primal and crazed predators driven by their bloodlust, to being aristocratic nobles caught up in the drama and intrigue of court. The appearance of vampires is similarly varied, although they all have fangs and cold pale skin. We're going to discuss these differences and many more as we learn of the vampires of the multiverse. Alright, let's dive in. We begin our study in vampires on the plains of Dominaria and Olgratha. I've combined the two planes because vampires share a common ancestry between them, which we'll discuss shortly. The creature type vampire has been around since the earliest days of magic, appearing in the card Sangir Vampire in Alpha. The name Sangir is legendary across both Dominaria and Olgrotha, invoking fear amongst mortals for centuries. The name can trace its roots to the first vampire ever created on Dominaria and the progenitor of the vampire race on both planes, Baron Sangir. Sangir was the son of a powerful baron that ruled lands on Dominaria. His father sought control and influence, but above all he sought a way to reach immortality so that he may rule forever. He dabbled in black magic and began incantations to transform both his son and himself towards vampirism. The young Sengir believed himself to be a more apt ruler and had a young orphan girl from a nearby village send a multitude of plague rats to kill his father. His plans backfired, however, and the rats attacked him, ripping his throat and killing him. In a flash of paternal instinct, his father shouted a spell that washed over the newly dead Sengir. The spell brought him back from death and preserved his life, transforming the young Sengir into the first vampire. Baron Sengir shares many characteristics with the typical vampire. He's charismatic, handsome, and domineering, with a painful aversion towards light and a need to feed on blood to sustain his immortality. He is capable of enthralling individuals to his will and transforming others into vampires. He spent many years accruing more land and power on Dominaria, as well as adding new vampires to his Sangir bloodline, before mysteriously vanishing from existence. For a time during the Ice Age and subsequent thaw on Dominaria, Krav, the capital city of Keldor, was overrun by plague, zombies, and vampires. These Krovikan vampires ruled over the now rotting city, led by their queen Garza Zal. Although it isn't explicitly stated, this vampire bloodline is most likely descended from the famous Baron Sangir. Without the influence of the Baron on the plain and over centuries of inbreeding, the current Sangir bloodline on Dominaria has degenerated. Once resembling their progenitor and retaining the physical features of their human state, Sangir vampires are now vile, misshapen, and repulsive creatures with bat-like ears, long claws, and inhuman facial features. So what happened to the father of vampires, and where did Sangir go? A fierce duel between two unnamed planeswalkers erupted on the plain of Olgrotha, to which the Baron was summoned. The planeswalker that summoned him was defeated, and with no way to traverse the blind eternities, Baron Sengir found himself trapped on Olgrotha, also known as the Homelands. The ancient and powerful vampire saw Olgrotha as ripe for the taking, and began conquering many settlements of dwarves and humans, ruling his holdings from Castle Sengir. The Baron began working on a new bloodline of vampires, which had not yet existed on the plain, and added the dwarven princess Irini and the elderly planeswalker Ravi, or Grandmother Sengir, to his family. Despite intervention from several planeswalkers, it's assumed that Sengir and his vampire army have conquered Olgratha. The fate of the plain can be seen in the background of Barony Vampire. Interestingly, it appears the vampires of the Sengir bloodline are capable of wielding more than just black mana. The red activated ability on Kazarov Sengir Pureblood suggests they can tap into red mana, and the ability of Castle Sengir as well as the casting cost of Garza's All suggests blue is another color these vampires can manipulate. The eerie and dark plain of Innistrad is home to many creatures of nightmares that prey upon mortals. It's a bleak place full of dark mana and reserved for the most wicked of beings. As such, it has a strong presence of vampires compared to other plains. The vampires of Innistrad are predominantly located in the region of Stensia, although they can be found in other locations. 
Their powers are strongly tied to both red and black mana. Vampires see themselves as the undisputed elite and nobility of the plane, ruling over their flocks of human citizenry from foreboding castles and manors. They believe they are shepherds and saviors of humanity, due in part to the nature of their origin, and see their conversion to vampirism as a sacrificial act of benevolence, giving up on their relationships and ties to humanity in order to protect the masses. Most are self-indulgent and vain, acting as affluent patrons and stewards to the menial lay people. They have very particular tastes and demand they be surrounded by the finest of everything, clothes, weapons, armor, art, and architecture. Humans are their primary source of sustenance, and they go to great lengths to protect their flock, much the same as a shepherd tends to his sheep. They keep ghouls, spirits, werewolves, and other beasts from killing their precious food. The vampires of Innistrad differ from others in the sense that they aren't cursed or diseased with vampirism. They aren't undead, but rather magically created beings, which is tied directly to their origins. Like most vampires, however, they rely on blood for food and need to consume at least 5 liters every moon cycle. If a vampire doesn't, they will quickly starve, withering away until they crumble to dust. Despite village tales and stories of the campfire, Innistrad vampires have only three abilities related to their nature. Immortality, slightly enhanced strength and speed, and an aura of silence that they can emanate from their bodies at will. Now many vampires have abilities far beyond these, but those come from their centuries-long practice and study of magic rather than purely from their condition. Physically, the vampires of Innistrad are pale with eerily glowing eyes, increased canine size, and bat-like features. Most vampires use mind-altering glamours to appear human so that they don't scare away their citizenry in public. A prime example of this is the card Lord of Lineage, whose front side depicts a vampire as he might appear under his glamour, while the flip side reveals the true features of a vampire. Elder vampires of different houses have become quite adept at skills such as flight, hypnotism, and transformation into animals. There are a few weaknesses that all vampires of Innistrad share. Living wood is particularly effective against them, and many vampire slayers wield weapons of wood. Silver and the moon of Innistrad are deeply tied to faith and angels and can hamper a vampire. Additionally, holy water blessed by the archangel Avacyn can be used like acid to melt them. In order for new vampires to be sired, vampire blood must be introduced to the body of the victim. Usually, the sire will cut their tongue or cheek, then bite the victim, sending their blood and their magic coursing through the body. Once that occurs, the victim is now considered anointed, but the process is not complete. In order for an anointed to become a vampire, their first bloodthirst must be taken from their sire. As they drink in the magic, the path to vampirism is finalized. If this doesn't happen, the anointed will quickly succumb to hunger and turn to dust. Established vampires have learned to control their thirst and maintain a level of decorum, while the newly sired are often blood-crazed and glut themselves on victims. Since vampires hold themselves in such high esteem, they are selective of whom they add to their families. As such, only the cream of the human crop become new vampires. But how was the first vampire created? Thousands of years ago, a great famine struck the region that would become Stensia just as the population was rapidly growing. A renowned alchemist named Edgar Markov sought a way to save his people from starvation and through his experiments learned of the dark magic of sangromancy or blood magic. He struck a deal with a demon to create a magic blood ritual that would grant those who partook agelessness and the ability to subsist on blood. This would solve the problem in two ways. First, those who conducted the ritual wouldn't need to eat crop to survive. And second, they would cull the population with their need for blood, decreasing the number of hungry mouths. And so, Edgar and a small group of other highborns conducted the ritual, becoming the progenitors of the current vampire lines. The vampires of the current day can trace their origins to one of the bloodlines present at the first ritual. Although 12 families were initially created, the four largest and most influential are represented in the sets. The Markov family is the most prestigious and numerous and can claim the right of first vampire family. Its leader is Edgar Markov and his grandson Sorn is a powerful planeswalker in the multiverse. Markov vampires seem to have more of a taste for gaudy decadence than other families and their elders are adept at psychic magic. The planeswalker Nahiri destroyed their ancestral home of Markov Manor, killing most members of this bloodline. The Falconrath family is so named as an homage to their progenitor, who is an adept falconer. Like the falcon, this bloodline is aggressive and predatory. They care little about nobility and finesse, claiming their prey in the thrill of the hunt. 
With little self-control, they are frequently blinded by a fit of bloodlust. Falkenrath vampires are bold and rarely use glamours, preferring to appear as their natural and nightmarish selves, as seen on the card Falkenrath Marauders. The elders are masters of flight. Although not the creator of the bloodline, Anya Falkenrath is a dangerous and influential member of the family. This family was quite vulnerable to the influence of Emrakul, and many transformed into Eldrazi horrors. The Voldaren vampires are less known, due in large part to their more distant and less social nature. Their progenitor Olivia was a wealthy recluse in life, and has built elaborate mansions for her family. The elder Voldarens are particularly good at transforming into other creatures, which we can see in the card Screeching Bat. Unlike the other houses, the Stromkirks refuse to partake in the elaborate drama and intrigue of their culture, choosing to build their home on the coastal region of Nephalia. Since there are far fewer vampires in this region, the Stromkirks have become the best at creating glamours to hide their nature so that they can mingle with their human citizens, seen in the card Stromkirk Noble. Their progenitor, Runo Stromkirk, was a member of a cult that worshipped an ancient god of the sea, which is why he chose to settle on the coast. The Stromkirk vampires are excellent patrons, funding beautiful artistic creations of their human population. The elders of this line are capable of transforming into mist. Like the Falkenrath family, the emergence of the Eldrazi hit the Stromkirks particularly hard, especially since they viewed Emrakul as the prophesied god of the sea. The vampires of Innistrad have an elaborate culture and dynamic relationship both with members of other bloodlines and with humans. Their origins have given rise to a species that has many unique characteristics compared to vampires of other planes. The fetid swamps and humid jungles of the continent of Guldraz is the perfect hunting grounds for the vampires of Zendikar, whose blood seekers and pulse trackers are particularly adept at tracking blood scents even among other vampire species. The plan of Zendikar is dangerous and unpredictable, and its vampires have taken on a similar disposition. They appear far more primal and less decadent than the vampires of other planes, wearing minimal amounts of clothing and covering themselves in bloodstained tribal patterns. Zendikari vampires don't use glamours to hide their true forms or walk among human citizenry, and this is mostly due to the chaotic nature of the royal, which leaves Zendikar as a whole much less advanced. This isn't to say that the vampires of the plane don't enjoy needless excess and grotesque self-indulgence, to which their capital city of Malakir is a testament. They rule from pretentious thrones much the same as vampires of other planes. The vampires of Zendikar are almost exclusively tied to black mana, due in large part to their connection to blood and sangromancy. Their ritualists and blood witches are unequaled at creating potions or hexes, or learning the future from the writings of blood. Unlike most other vampire races, Zendikari vampires are not immortal, but they are long-lived, having lifespans of roughly 200 years. Their condition is an infection of the blood with a horrible origin that has been passed down for millennia. The infection alters their physical appearance, creating jagged horns and bony spikes that protrude from their head, shoulders, or elbows. They have increased speed, strength, and intellect, but are required to subsist on the blood of living creatures. It seems that most also have the innate ability to levitate and fly. They have long forgotten any sense of morality and believe that the strong have the right to take what they want from the weak. In this regard, they are brutal and vile, even when compared to other vampire species. So how exactly did the infection come to be? Thousands of years ago, a triad of planeswalkers trapped and imprisoned three otherworldly beings of immeasurable destructive power. These Eldrazi titans were held in stasis under the mountains of Akum for many years. An ancient tribe came to worship the titans and created a religious cult around them, believing them to be gods and saviors. The titan Ulamog's pestilent aura created an infection within the worshippers who began performing blood rituals that loosened the chains on the Eldrazi. This allowed their brood lineages to come bursting out, and a wave of energy from Ulamog washed over the cultists, amplifying the infection and transforming them into the first vampires, of which Rayami was one. Only a handful of cultists survived the transformation and Eldrazi hordes, but they became prisoners to Ulamog and extensions of his will, the spikes on their bodies acting as handles for Eldrazi drones to control them. When the planeswalker Nahiri resealed the titans, the vampires forgot their origins and heritage, but retained a shred of memory of their oppression. Over the centuries, the number of vampires has oscillated, but thousands existed in the modern era, split into five major families. The Bloodchief is the leader of the family and progenitor of its bloodline. 
In fact, Blood Chiefs are the last members of the first vampires created by Ulamog, and as such are the only creatures that can sire new vampires. The infection within them must be passed into the bloodstream of their victim. The infection spreads quickly, transforming the body and altering the minds until the victim becomes a vampire. This process also imprints the Blood Chief's tastes, preferences, and personality onto the newly sired vampire, so members of the same family share similar qualities. Although lesser vampires can't sire themselves, they possess the ability to create gnolls, mindless, undead, zombie-like creatures that are tied to their master's will. They do this by completely draining a creature of blood and then reanimating its corpse. Humans aren't the only creatures that are reanimated this way, and this is seen in the card Baloth Knoll. Each vampire brings with it a contingent of gnolls appropriate of its social status. The five major bloodlines rule Guldraz from Malakir, the Dark City. It is a place of debauchery and vice, where vampires mingle socially and tout their superiority. Unlike with most other vampire cultures, the streets of Malakir are completely devoid of humans or other creatures that may act as peasantry for the vampires. The vampires do, however, still rule over other port cities and villages of Guldraz, tormenting the population. The city itself is divided into five zones, and each is run by one of the bloodlines. House Calastria is the oldest and wealthiest of the vampire houses, and it's ruled by the blood chief Drana. Calastria vampires view themselves as highborn, even compared to other vampires. In contrast, House Get, ruled by Kalitas, is the poorest and least influential of the houses. It has had a tumultuous history of infighting and corruption, setting it back in the eyes of other vampires. House Nirkana is led by the blood chief Tenali, and this family is notorious for its master assassins, known as Lacerators. The final two houses, Emavira and Ernav, aren't mentioned directly on cards, but the former is a wealthy rival to House Calastria, and the latter boasts the largest numerical contingent of vampires. The devastation wrought by the Eldrazi after they broke free from their prison hit vampires the hardest. Their very nature and origins are deeply linked to Ulamog, and their ancient history of servitude once again made its way to the forefront. The Eldrazi Titan called to the vampires, piercing their minds and beckoning them to Balaged, where it could consume their energy to fuel itself. Thousands were instantly enthralled by Ulamog and perished in a moment that would later be referred to as the Culling. Thousands yet fought against the call of the Eldrazi, remembering their past and refusing to be enslaved once more. This led to a civil war within the vampires as the pawns of Ulamog, led by the traitorous Kalitas, fought and slayed their non-compliant kin. This wholesale violence led to the destruction of Malakir City and the dissolution of vampire society. The free vampires led by the Colostria blood chief Drana fought against the Eldrazi with other allies of the plane, desperately holding on to their freedom. The mindless vampires of Ulamog can be seen tending to Eldrazi spawn and acting as drones to greater Eldrazi, extending their will. It remains to be seen what befalls the vampires with the defeat of the Eldrazi, so their future is up to speculation. Will they rebuild their fractured society and repair their old cities, or will their infection of the blood, whose nature depended on the presence of Ulamog, cease to exist and revert them back to what they were before? On the far-flung plain of Ixalan exists a race of vampires similar to others in most respects, but with one striking novelty. They are devoted to church and faith. This belief is showcased in the hallmark characteristic of the Ixalan race, the first emergent of mono-white vampires. Vampires across the multiverse have traditionally been mono-black due to their undead state, their thirst for blood, their use of dark magic, and their selfish drive for power. Black and white vampires are not uncommon or surprising, as this color combination most closely relates to the link of life and death, and the essence-stealing power vampires have to preserve themselves. But mono-white vampires hint at both a belief in something greater than themselves and the nature of their centuries-old inception, although it has been muddied and transformed over the years. So how is it that vampires came to be on Ixalan? The mountainous region of Torizon, on a continent separate from Ixalan, was the resting place of the infamous and powerful immortal sun, and its people were chosen by its creator to act as its stewards. A religion of priests and warrior nuns developed around this mysterious artifact, whose powers were known to be otherworldly. A young woman, Alenda of Garano, was a nun of this religion and wholly devoted to the immortal sun's protection. When word of the powerful artifact reached other nations, they marched on Torrezon to claim it for themselves. Padron the Wicked attacked the monastery and killed everyone inside except for Alenda. 
With what strength she had left, she rushed outside to stop Padron, but the mysterious creator of the immortal sun appeared, took it from him, and flew to the west. Alenda, now the only survivor of the religious order entrusted to protect the artifact, refused to give up her purpose. She sailed west to the uncharted continent of Ixalan to search for it. For years she looked for the sun without an inkling of its location and grew fearful she would die before finding it. She resorted to black magic and learned of a ritual that would preserve her for centuries at the cost of losing her soul and becoming a creature that was neither dead nor alive. As such, Elenda became the first vampire of Ixalan. She traveled back to Torazon to find it in the midst of a bloody religious civil war. With her newly acquired power, she swiftly ended the war. The nobility and clergy sought to learn this power, so she taught them the blood rite that would grant them immortality so they too could take on the burden of finding the immortal sun. This became known as the Rite of Redemption. This story can be gleaned from the flavor text of Hierophant's Chalice. Alenda sailed west once again to continue her search, but never returned. She has been remembered through history as Saint Alenda, the Dusk Rose, and progenitor of vampires. Over the centuries, the vampires have forgotten their true purpose but haven't lost any of their zeal. The vampires of the Church of Dusk combined with the vampire monarchy of Queen Meralda and used their superhuman abilities to conquer the entire continent. This new holy order, named the Legion of Dusk, is aggressive, expanding its borders ever outward to gain new blood from which to feast. In time, the nature of vampirism slowly transitioned from a burden of holy sacrifice to a weapon of power and fanaticism. With the duality of its existence, members of the Legion of Dusk are split between their faith to the church and their loyalty to the queen, although matters of church and state almost always overlap. Regardless, some vampires are completely devoted to their religion while others look to conquest for their queen. Despite this, all vampires on Torazon tout their superiority and are viewed as holy by their human populations. Ixalan vampires feed only on the blood of the guilty to sustain themselves, usually traitors to the crown and rebellious pirates, although the term guilty is often defined individually, especially with more opportunistic vampires. Many partake in a religious ceremony known as the blood fast, in which they refrain from drinking for weeks to months on end in order to strengthen their religious bonds. When a vampire finally gives in to hunger, they become bestial and uncontrollable, feasting on everything in sight. This state is known as rapture and is dangerous to all those around. Truly devoted members of the Legion have been gifted the ability to fly, known as exultation, in which their lower body becomes wispy tendrils of mist. Interestingly, the vampires of Ixalan don't seem affected by light like most others, and this could be tied to their deep connection to white mana. Not satisfied with owning a continent, and with a distant memory of their inception, the Legion of Dusk turned its eyes across the sea to Ixalan in hopes of recovering the immortal sun, as well as Saint Alenda. They believe the ancient artifact has the power to preserve their immortality, but cure them of their undead state and the need to feed on blood. They set sail in their Dusk Legion dreadnoughts to claim both history and glory. The first vampires to cross were known as the Sanctum Seekers and are the most zealous religious warriors of the Legion. Eventually they found the golden city of Araska, resting place of the immortal sun. They sacked and pillaged many buildings in search for the sun and stumbled upon the tomb of the bat god Aklazots, where a newly awakened Alenda emerged from her coffin. Enraged to see what her ancient religious order had become, Alenda demanded to be taken back to Torazon and confront the queen. The current state of the vampire monarchy is unknown, but with the discovery of its progenitor and subsequent loss of the immortal sun, the religion has been shaken to its core. With the major vampire races discussed, we'll turn our attention towards a few plans where vampires have less of a presence or influence, starting with Ravnica. The vampires of Ravnica, known as Moroi, are an ancient race and different than others in the sense that they aren't actually undead. These living vampires are famed for their psionic abilities and drain the youth and memories of their victims rather than their blood. This can be seen in the art of the card Psychic Drain. They are slender, leathery creatures with wings that allow them to fly and are unaffected by the sunlight. Their more feral appearance might be due to their ancient origins and longevity. The oldest of Morai might actually turn into skeletal vampires seen prowling the night sky. The abilities of the Moroi make them valuable assets to House Demir. In fact, the founder of House Demir, Zedek, was one such vampire, although his features were strikingly human. Perhaps this is suggestive of his hunting prowess, as his many victims were able to preserve his youthful look. The more traditional vampires that feed on blood are also found on Ravnica, and they are most commonly associated with the Orzov Syndicate. 
acting as tithe takers and enforcers, gladly taking their payment in blood. The vampires of Orzova are usually lower ranking syndicate members that have been denied continued existence via the spirit, so have settled for the physical immortality offered by vampirism. The vampires of Alara were exclusively found on the shard of Grixis before the conflux and like the Sengir vampires are tied to black, blue, and red mana. They feed on Vis, the life force of other creatures, and the amount of Vis consumed correlates to the power they wield. Life on a shard consumed by death is difficult though, and many of the vampires are starving and frail. With the conflux, they finally have fresh life to feed on. On Tarkir, the vampires are known as Keru, and they are strikingly unique in their physical appearance. Long, slithery tongues emerge from mouths with unusually lengthy tusks and lash out at their victims. These vampires are at home in the dank swamps of Tarkir and are associated with the Soltai clan. The vampires of Merodin are named after the putrid and corrosive swamp of the Mephedros in which they reside. It was originally believed that only one Mephedros vampire existed, but an entire coven was discovered whose members consist of the once human Moriok that turned to vampirism for survival in the brutal swamps. Like all creatures of Merodin, the Mephedros vampires have integrated pieces of metal within their bodies, and they have unusually long claws. Perhaps their descendants were once vampires of another plane that became trapped on Merodin by Memnarch. The vampires of the multiverse can take on vastly different appearances and have disparate cultures, but all share an unquenchable thirst for the blood or life force of other beings, and all instill a sense of dread in both the beings they rule and those they hunt. Their unnatural abilities and longevity grant them an edge against most other creatures on their respective planes and solidify their positions near the top of the hierarchy. Thanks for watching this discussion on the nature of vampires and magic. Leave a thumbs up if you liked the video and a thumbs down if you didn't. This was a bit longer of a video with a different format, but I really enjoyed researching and compiling all of this information for you. In fact, I hope to make this into a series and deeply explore other creatures that span the history of the multiverse. But you've heard me talk long enough, and now I want to hear from you. So let me know in the comments if you are interested in more videos like this, and give me your suggestions on topics you'd like to hear. I've linked the references used for this video in the description below. And be sure to subscribe for weekly content. Until next time, go forth and explore the lore.